Amen. Like that word of God, turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. We read verses 26 through 39. You also find this account. The demon possessed man we're going to look at this morning. As in all three of the synoptic gospels, you can find it in Mark chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 8 as well. But we'll look at try to stay in here as much as possible right here in Luke. Chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. You read along with it. We're going to read several verses this morning. I know how that is. I think we need to read the whole story to kind of get what's going on here. And you stay with me. And we'll just see what the Lord will do. Preach to our hearts this morning. Verse 26 of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, the Word of God tells us, And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. Now, don't you notice there the name Legion? This is, this is something that's organized. A legion... And that day was a band of Roman soldiers. Uh, it would be up to maybe 6,000 uh, soldiers uh, that were in that legion. They were in that company. They were in that battalion. They, wouldn't, they were very organized. Uh, they all marched in step. They all knew what they had to do. They all took orders. Uh, this isn't just something that uh, we can take lightly. When we're talking about demonic activity, the world looks at, when you say that, and many people probably this morning look at me like I'm crazy, but it's in the Word of God. It goes on today. If we were to pull back the curtain this morning and see what was going on uh, with the prince and the power of the air, we'd be terrified. Now, people may laugh and scoff at that, but there, as sure as there's a devil, there's demons. And the Bible preaches that, teaches that. We... It's not some. Uh, we made fun of this stuff until it's uh, until it's almost a joke. Uh, the devil's not wearing a red suit. He doesn't have a tail. He's not carrying around a pitchfork. He doesn't have horns. Uh, we've characterized these things and made fun of these things, and these are of the most serious uh, topics this morning that we're going to talk about. And so this legion had entered into this man. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. Mark says it was 2,000 of them. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. And when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means that he was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went up unto the ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Uh, God, I pray you'd help me to preach this morning, Lord Father. Start up here at this pulpit, Lord Father. Work your way through this church, Lord Father, in every ear. Father, I pray you just uh, 
use to open it, Lord Father, to hear what you're saying to us this morning. Touch our hearts, Lord. Put a hedge around us uh, for the next little bit, Lord Father, that we might get the victory over the prince and the power of the air, Lord Father. You might not snatch your word away, but that, Lord Father, your seed would settle down in good soil today, Lord God, that you'd grow it and move in people's hearts and lives. So we just thank you for what you're going to do, Lord God. We ask you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Again, uh, one of the more remarkable instances of a miracle done in the Bible, uh, and perhaps a familiar story to us all, is the the demon, the maniac of Gadara. And here, as we read this this story this morning, we realize if we were to read the whole chapter and put it all together, that Jesus is in Capernaum. Uh, he's on his teaching and, and, and ministry there, and, and he's doing miracles there. And he decides to go over here in, in Luke chapter 8, over into the country of Decapolis, over into the uh, area here of the Gadarenes. And uh, he puts the disciples there, if we were to read in verses 20 through, uh, through 25 of this chapter, he puts the disciples, he places them in a boat, and he says, we're going to go over to the other side. And as they go over to the other side, they face a storm, and they're placed in the middle of that storm. And they had to go through the storm with Jesus in order to go to the other side to help someone else. Your storm in your life sometimes is not all about you. Sometimes if Jesus puts us in a storm and sets us sail that we might get on over to the other side because somebody over there needs some help. And in these storms in life, sometimes they're cause of our sin and we're reaping it what we sow. Sometimes God's using them in other ways in our life. And now He's put these disciples and Himself in a, in a ship where the storm uh, is going to beat the ship and, and almost drown them in the storm and destroy the ship. And yet Jesus is the captain of the ship. And listen, as spiritually speaking, you and I, we're going through the sea of life. And we're going to hit some storms. And uh, some of these storms are, are used in, in different ways, uh, but God has a purpose for the storms in our life. And as sure as He puts you in the sea and puts you through the storm, and if He's got a place for you to go, He's going to get you to the other side. Right. And you'll notice there that it says in verse 26 that they arrived at the country. On the other side of the sea was another country they had to do business in. I'm glad one day uh, when the sea is no more and the storms are no more, I'm going to be safe on the other side. I'm going to do business in another country. And these guys are going to do business in another country. And that storm was there to prepare them for what they were going to face. And we find out that they're going to face a man that was demon-possessed. Now the demon possession of this man, spiritually speaking, parallels with what's going on in all, all of our lives before we get saved. There's so much in common between, uh, we may not be demon possessed, but we're certainly uh, oppressed by Satan. You don't have to be possessed for him to come and oppress you and, to do, and to get you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. And he's, a, he's an enemy that's a roaring lion. Uh, and he's out to kill, steal, and destroy. And he'll do that to you. He'll do that to the unsaved. But he, that's his mission in life, is to kill, steal, and destroy. He's the father of the lies. And there's no truth in it. And there's nothing to be made fun of and joked about. It's very serious what's going on in, in our lives today with the spiritual warfare. Because that's what we're fighting, the spiritual warfare that's going on in lives. Now you'll notice that they get to the other side and they see this man that's possessed with a demon. And first thing you'll notice is the, the, the sin that has destroyed this man's life. Now Hebrews 11.25 uh, said that sin is pleasurable for a season. Okay, But this man tells us that he had been a long time in this situation. And I can assure you that it didn't start out immediately like it ended up. Okay? And this man didn't start out like that. In fact, the Bible tells us as we read that story that he had a home and he had friends. He had people around him. But I want to tell you, he gave sin just a little bit of his life. And it started out pleasure for a season, but the end thereof is destruction. And you may not ever get demon possessed. And you may never go as far as the demon possessed man in this story. But sin is out to destroy you and if it's not taken care of, it will destroy you and lead to death. The wages of sin is death. 
The way, listen, the, a, sin, a life that is absent of Jesus Christ uh, is a life that will end up in one place, and that's a place called hell. Amen. And so there was destruction in this man's life. It says, but for a long time, he went forth, met them out of the city, which had devils a long time. You see, that's more than one season. That's many seasons. How it must have started out so good for this man, but the end thereof was destruction. Mark chapter 5 of this same story says this man was crying night and day, cutting himself with stones. He was self-mutilating himself. In other words, uh, he was cutting himself. Did you know, as I was studying this for the sermon, I found out that that's something that has reappeared in our culture today. Did you know that? I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. I had no idea that self-mutilation and cutting was so big. That they, some estimate almost 40% of teenagers at one time or another are cutting themselves. They're cutting themselves. They're cutting themselves to, to disfigure their self. It's called self-mutilation. It's a big epidemic uh, in the United States. And they're doing it, and when they ask why they're doing it, they say, well, it helps me to deal or cope with what's going on in my life. And millions of young people are doing cutting themselves uh, with different instruments even today. Listen, uh, you may be dealing with that today. That may be somebody in your family dealing with that today, but that's not how you deal with life. Right. You deal with life through the person of Jesus Christ. And, and, and there's an epidemic going on. Listen, if that's going on in your life, this marking ourselves, this self-mutilation, listen, that's not from God. You need to stop that this morning. Right. That's not from God. Uh, we're in a, in a, <clears throat> we could go on and on about that, but we see that popping up uh, in different areas of our, our children's life. And, and so I, I was amazed when I studied that, how dangerous uh, that is. And you know, we're playing around with these demonic things, and it's, you know, the TV is consumed with death. You ever notice that? There's all kinds of, of zombies and apocalypse and, and, and stories about uh, witches and, and casting spells. And boy, it's so funny, and, and they make it seem so uh, enticing for us to go and watch that kind of stuff on TV. But when you open yourselves up, and listen to me, this ain't going to get a lot of amens, but when you open yourself up a little stuff like that, a little, watching a little bit of the horoscope, yeah. seeing what Mars going to bring for you, amen? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and, and all of these things are, seem like they're such a joke, like a Ouija board. Mm, right? Yeah, you, you see, you're opening yourselves up to something that you have no idea what it's going to do to you. And it's dangerous to play with that stuff. When you get in tune with that kind of stuff, you're just playing on fire. There's stuff out here right now going through the air. Images, profane images and sounds, and devilish stuff going through the airs right now. The only reason we don't hear it is we're not tuned into it. Yeah. Unless if I was coming here and bring a radio in here and get it tuned just right, we'd tune into some field this morning right here in the house of God. How about the TV? Listen, if you just pull your phone out, there's some images coming through here right now. You can tune right in with your phone. Some devilish stuff. You see, the reason we can't is because we're not tuned into it. But if you tune yourself into this kind of thing, eventually it'll grab a hold and take a hold of you. Because most of the time when you listen, uh, Jesus talked about, uh, used this about this demonic influence. He talked about this just over in the next chapter or two, over in Luke chapter 11. Let me read this to you. He didn't do use the analogy of a home, but he's talking about this home. He's talking about this tabernacle. And in chapter 11 of Luke, verse 24, he says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finding none. So here's this unclean spirit. It's a demon. Uh, it's it's the, in the spiritual realm. And he's seeking rest and he's finding none. And he saith, I will return unto my house when I came out of it. What's he talking about? Who's the house? He's talking about one of these houses. Okay? He's talking about this house. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Boy, I'll tell you, I've seen it time and time again. I've tried it time and time again. Listen, I'm going to clean up. Man, I'm going to put on the right suit. 
get my hair right. Listen, I'm gonna take out the earrings. I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna get right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do everything I can in my own ability uh, to get right to break the chains of, of what Satan is doing in my life. And I sweep and I garnish myself and I clean myself up the best I can. We try it all the time. I try. It. Everybody's tried. We want to do better. We want to clean ourselves up. But here's what the problem is. Then he goeth and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. This is, is this not frightening? I, we read this kind of stuff, and I think because <coughs> this is Jesus talking. He, he, he don't know what Jesus don't know what he's saying. He did, this is different. It's two thousand years ago. It doesn't make a difference what he said. More wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Okay. Here's what he said the problem was. He says this same parable in Matthew, and he adds this one word, and it makes all the difference. He said, I cleaned it up, I swept it, and I garnished. And when they came back, they found the house. You know what they found? It empty. Yeah. Yeah. Empty. You see, there's something inside you that needs to be filled. And without the person of Jesus Christ, you are empty. And if you're empty, it, listen, it's not, it, something's going to fill that emptiness. Okay? And when the, seven, when the man tried to clean up and there was no more sinning in his life and he was getting made off the drugs or drinking or whatever and the devils and the demons left, they said, look, this guy's cleaning up. He said, but give it a little while and when we come back, if his house is empty, we'll just move in. In fact, there'll be more room for us and it'll be worse this time than it was the last time. Have you ever seen that in somebody's life? Yeah. Sure, yeah. It is just a never ending cycle. We're going to clean up a little bit. But you see, you've got an empty house. Is your house empty this morning? Is it empty in here? I, I, I mean, are you dwelling, and is Christ dwelling in your house? The secret place. That's what Psalm 91 said. He. That hideth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Where have you got abiding in your life? Where are you abiding? Where are you living at this morning? How's your house this morning? Let that mess come in your house, friend. Into this house and the sticks and, and nail house that you live in. Let that come into your home. Let Satan have a foot in your home. What you're listening to, what you're watching, what you're doing at home. Listen, let that come into your house and watch Satan take in total control. There's no stopping. There's no stopping. He'll take control of your home. Be careful what we're doing in front of our children. Be careful what we're letting into our life. Listen, be careful. This man was cutting himself. He was screaming. He was hollering. And that's what's going on in our world today. People are out there living in the tombs and they're taking our next generation and destroying it. Notice also that the demons recognize Jesus and know more about Him than many Christians and many, and many people do. I'm serious. They've got their theology right. <coughs> they, listen, even they know. Do you notice what they did? They came and they fell at His feet and said, Jesus, You're the Most High. Didn't they? they knew He was the Most High. Why? Because they knew that He was God. Because why? Because He had kicked them out of heaven thousands of years before. They knew all about it. Listen, they even prayed to Jesus, didn't they? It says there in verse 28, they beseeched Him. Verse 31 says they besought Him. Verse 32 said they besought Him. In other words, they're begging Him not to send them out into nothing, but to send them out into those swine. They were praying to Him. Uh, they were recognizing that He was the God of the Most High. That there was a time coming when He would judge them. But He said, before you judge us, it's not the time just yet to send them out to this one. The demons had their theology right. You know, the demons, uh, they never mock God in the Bible. Did you ever notice that? Uh, we mock God today in our country. And you can see it on the radio. We make fun of him. The TV shows. You watch this Hollywood crowd. Listen, they not getting one penny of my money. Amen. I'll just thank you for those two amens. <laughs> I'm not, 
that I will not put any money into that stuff is mocking my God on TV. Laughing at my God on TV. Proclaiming the name of God to get up there and win an award and all these athletes and stuff. Boy, I'm preaching now. Listen. <laughs> and, and we want to thank God. How dare they invoke the name of my God when they're out there doing that, just that filthy, nasty stuff. No, we're mocking God. Making a mockery of the Savior. But the devils knew who had the power. And even they bowed down at His feet and cried out and said, He's the God of the Most High. Did you notice this man, his friends tried to get him help in verse 29? It says, For oftentimes it had caught him and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters and he broke the bands and was driven uh, of the devil into the wilderness. Mark 5 says that no man, in verse 13, says that no man could tame him. His friends tried to help him. They bound him up. Uh, they would uh, chain him up. Try to keep him at home. Uh, they were trying to get him into uh, all kinds of different programs, I bet. Uh, I'm sure they were trying everything they could to get him back and reel him back in. You know what? He just got worse. They were trying to help him. But it was useless. You see, only Jesus can actually change someone. All right. He's the only one that can change something. He's the only one that can take something old and make it new. <coughs> First, that same verse there in chapter 5 of Mark, and I won't flip back to confusion, but when Jesus talked to those demons, you know what He told them? It says that He gave them leave to depart and go into the swine. What does Jesus need to give you leave for in your life? What does Jesus need to come on the scene in your life and say, you know what, you need to leave. <laughs> you need to get out of this house. Whatever is going on in your life right now that's not honoring God, you need Jesus to come down and say, you know what, I give you leave to leave. Get out. Don't come back. When Jesus gets a hold of this man, the demons flee and they don't come back. You know what I'm saying? They don't come back. What do you need Jesus to give leave for in your life? He said, you demons, get out of here. <coughs> Did you notice too that the healing in this man, as we read this story, uh, comes from the inside out? Did you notice that? You see, we like to put band-aids on the stuff that shows out. But the actual problem was sin in his life, wasn't it? He was cutting himself. Why? Because sin. He was shrieking and crying, living with the tombs, living with the graves out there. Why? Because of sin. You see, what we do is we look at the problem, we look at the activity, and we start with that. Jesus doesn't look at these secondary things. All those things are a cause of one thing, and that's sin in our life. The demons. Are... Jesus dealt with the main things. You come in, you're looking for help. Listen, I, I, I've got an addiction problem. I've got some kind of problem. Yeah, all that is just secondary stuff. You see, you've got to push through all that stuff and get down to the real root of the problem. And that's sin and Satan in your life. And that's what problem was here. James chapter 1 tells us that, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You notice that? When lust has conceived. It says something on the inside. It started with the channels, the eyes, and the ears. And it gets on the inside and it begins to fester. And you begin to pull up and park and start thinking about this stuff. And when it's conceived, it eventually shows out. You know, sin's got all kinds of fruits, doesn't it? Those fruits show out. Jesus, He talked about that. He said, listen, any, uh, the tree, that don't bear the good fruit. He laid the axe to it, didn't He? Just like salvation produces fruit, sin produces fruit. Don't kid yourself. Don't think that you... Listen, you get saved, they got to be a change in your life. You can't have the God Almighty of the universe come and reside in you and not be a change in your life. It's impossible. There's never anybody in the Bible that you read about that got saved that there wasn't a change in their life. Now, listen, I don't judge... Listen... God's the final judge. 
But this idea that we can get saved and stay the same is not Bible. It's not in the Bible. You won't find it in the Bible. There's going to be a change in your life. No, you're not going to be sinless. No, you're not going to be perfect. Yes, you're going to be on the milk. Yes, you're going to have to get up and start eating on the meat. Yes, you're going to grow. Yes, you're going to sin and fall backwards and make mistakes and be lukewarm at times. But there is going to be a change in your life when you get the real thing. This is God. Yeah. Yeah. This talking people into getting saved and dragging this thing on for two or three hours at the altar and, <coughs> and working up people. Listen, I'm an emotional guy. I like to get excited when I preach. But I'm not going to talk anybody into getting saved. If it's not enough power to get you out of the pew, then why would you even come down if I drug you down here? Listen, when you get the power of God on your life, you'll get up. You'll come and make a public profession. You'll praise Jesus. His praises will be on your lips. Listen, your life will be changed. There's just no doubt about it that getting saved changes your life. There's no doubt about it. You notice that Jesus, after the miracle, was asked to leave. Isn't that the saddest thing you've ever read? In other words, they'd rather have the pigs back than for Jesus to stay. In other words, they would rather choose the hog pen than Jesus. And that's what sin will do to you. Isn't it a choice? It don't have choices in life. You have some choices in life. Don't ask. I can't explain God's free will. And man's, I mean, man's free will and God's sovereign. Yeah. I don't know. I wish I could explain it to you. You can't explain it either. The secret things belong to God. But I know this. He granted me faith. He granted me repentance. And, and listen, I know this, that Jesus won't stay anywhere that He's not wanted. Yeah. yeah. They said, you get out. We don't want you. He's a perfect gentleman. You know what He said? He got said, let's go, boys. Back in the boat. Amen. Jesus was ready to stay. Jesus could have done some more miracles. Jesus was ready to listen. He didn't tell him what he would have done. They said, we'd just rather have the pigs back, but you go on, Jesus. And people are making that kind of choice each day in their life. We'd rather live in the hog pen than have Jesus in our life. Sure, that's what we're making. Just making bad choices. And then you'll notice there at the very end. That this man that was possessed with the demons got the real thing. Now you know why he got the real thing, and I know why he got the real thing. One is that when they found him, he was clothed. He had been naked. Naked speaks of shame. Okay. Listen, don't give me. I'm not a close. I don't care. I'm not a close line preacher. But the more you show, that's more shame in your life. Yeah. That's why everything you can't watch a car commercial. What's a naked woman got to do with me buying my next Ford? Right. <laughs> what is all that about? Don't be ignorant of the devil's devices. Yeah. Sports Illustrated. That's pornography. Yes. I mean, I like sports. I used to get Sports Illustrated. But it's just pornography now. It's all in. It's all. Thank you for that. Amen. <laughs> all three of them. Somebody probably needs to go home and got one in his house. <laughs> but that's what we've come to. That's the way everything on TV is. Uh, let's just show uh, as much of ourselves as we can on, and, and entice men or whatever. Don't fall for that, man. He's in his right mind. Hey, listen, he renews your mind. Okay? He renews your mind. And he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Somebody gets saved, that's where they want to be, at the feet of Jesus. That's a sure sign. Of it. Notice what it says here. It said that he begged him in verse 38 that he might be with him. You want to be with the one you love. Yeah. Sure you do. He wanted to be with him. And Jesus said, No. Return to thy own house. Isn't it amazing uh, throughout the scripture? 
how concerned Jesus is about the home. Amen. Over and over again, He's coming into people's homes <coughs> and changing the home. Over and over again, He's telling people, you need to go back to your home and get your home right. Jesus emphasizes the home because everything proceeds and comes out of the home. Hey, listen, when churches ain't right, uh, go to the homes. The homes ain't right. right. It's not get the church right and the home will get right. Get the home right and your church will get right. Yeah. Your home, the home's out of order. The home's out of order. He said, you know what you can do? The best thing you can do for me is I know you want to be with me, but I want you to go home and I want you to show forth everything. You notice the word he said, why didn't he say go tell? Why didn't he say you? He said, go show. What? Go show. He didn't just say go tell. He said, go show. You know what he can show? Listen, uh, this may have some scars. We're just talking about it, day and night, taking those rocks and cutting them. Say, I believe he kept the scars. Yeah. Bible say it took away his scars. Didn't say anything about that. But his scars, when Jesus said, go show you, listen, this man was a walking <coughs> testimony of what God delivered him from. Everywhere he went, he could say, you know what God's done for me? Check this out. Yeah. That's what I used to be. He said, but now I'm changed. Listen, so many times, listen, everybody's got scars. Yeah. If you don't think you got none, let me open your closet door and watch those bones right. start rattling out of there. <laughs> me too. Well, God. But listen, most time we just take that and we, we lose that opportunity. Most time we look at our scars and we're, we're bitter about it. We're bitter. Resentful about it. Jesus said, Won't you go show those scars somebody and see somebody and tell them about me? Listen, it, it, you are a walking testimony as a Christian of what God can do in your life. Amen. What God can deliver you from. Where God can bring you to. And listen, those scars are a perfect testimony for this maniac with his scars. He became a great missionary wherever he went. Why? Because, listen. His scars didn't make him bitter. They just proved what God had done in his life. I wonder if you'd just stand with me. Go ahead and grab your hymn books. Page 220. You turn to page 220. Maybe you say, you know what, I'm not demon possessed. And I'm sure you're not. I would grant to say that nobody in here this morning is demon possessed. But I will tell you, if you don't think you're demon oppressed, listen, if Satan's not bothering you this morning, I would worry about that. <laughs> if I'm not in a battle, if you're not raging against him this morning, if you're not fighting a good fight of faith this morning, he's not bothering you, you're not being tempted by him, uh, more power to you, but most likely you're just not doing a whole lot for God. But if you want to get victory this morning over these things in your life, if you want to get deliverance, if you just need to tell Satan, listen, you need to say, Jesus, I want you to tell Satan to leave. <laughs> Some of these things in my life need to leave out. Some of these things I got going on need to leave out of my life. You need Jesus to come in and say, you know what, Satan, it's time for you to get out. Maybe you got something in your home. I got to get that thing right. I got to get, I got to get some relief from that tonight. This morning, why don't you come while we're playing a few some songs? Uh, go ahead and lead us in the 220. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Listen, you come and use this altar. I still believe an old fashioned altar. Come on down and use it. Get some victory. Maybe you got some scars. You just need to say, hey, you know what? I've been looking at these scars wrong. I've just been letting these things bring bitterness in my life. Listen, let your scars be your testimony this morning and say, you know what, God, use these things in my life to make me, make me better. Use these as a tool of witness in my life. You can do that. You can do that in your life. You just need the victory this morning. You come. Maybe you say, my house is empty. Preacher, I, I have got Jesus in my home. I've never been saved. My house is empty. This might be swept and garnished, but it's empty. Why don't you come? I'd love to share Jesus Christ with you. You just 
has come. Whatever it is, you come. When God's dealing with people, you come.